So this is going to be a little of a, well, make it a difficult segment, uh, but it's worthwhile, so please stay tuned on this. Todd Lubas works with us at the Independence Institute, works in our development office. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. We got a few things in common besides a political point of view. Um, I lost my daughter to a remarkably rare and vicious form of, of uh, cancer, cord plexus carcinoma. I remember it uh, to this day. Um, and it's been, it's hard to believe, it's, it's been 16 years ago, it's just like yesterday. I had no idea that when you started working with us, your family had a, had a similar story. What was it? Yes, it was uh, my niece, Josie. Uh, she's a twin sister to her sister, Samantha, and she uh, was a seemingly healthy, smiling, beautiful little girl. And one day during dinner, the right side of her face uh, sort of collapsed. It went, went numb and they rushed her to the ER, and within 24 hours, a CAT scan said that she has a rare form of DIPG, which is a cancerous tumor in your brainstem, and that she had nine to 16 months to live. And uh, the hardest thing my family has ever gone through, uh, watching my sister and mother and, and people crumble, and it's, it's the hardest thing, as, as you know, John, a sick child is probably right. nothing, nothing harder to, to, to witness. Right. I remember this like it was it was it was yesterday. To and again, it, it took it took a day to find out that she was vomiting and vomiting, but it was just a normal thing. Finally, brought her in. They said, "Well, let's put her on an IV." And we had no idea because we're young and stupid, and we're happy to have a have a have this child. And then said, "No, it's it's there's a tumor." And off to the old children's hospital, uh, and which was for us a torture chamber. Uh, and then the MRI saying, no, the cancer is spread, but we're going to have to do this biopsy. And then the report, it's this thing, and there ain't no way out of it. Um, uh, she was supposed to live weeks. She lived hours uh, when we got her home. And um, it, it was, I've, I've, I've been helpless before, but I've never felt so completely helpless. I mean, just, and to, this was your niece, and I, I can't imagine what your sister, you know, is still dealing with. It's only been two years. Her, uh, my brother-in-law, her husband is also is a physician, so you talk about that feeling of helplessness yeah. when your job is to save lives and you can do nothing. It was, uh, uh, it, it, it broke me in many ways in, in seeing my family go through that and, and seeing this beautiful little girl. It was, uh, uh, it affected me in, in many ways, and a lot of it now that uh, she has passed in uh, 2015, uh, it's been a motivating factor to, to live life for her, and that's actually part of what, what got me to Colorado, actually, to, to live life for her. You know, and it's, it's interesting. Two years after you lose a child is a really tough mark. Now, you're your uncle, uh, but for parents, it's also a particularly tough mark because the, the world thinks, hey, look, they're back up on the horse, they're doing well because they can go through a few motions. They, they can actually do their laundry now without somebody doing it for them. You know, they can, they can get to work and have a conversation, maybe without breaking down, but it's still just vicious at that time. I can say 15 years into this, 16 years into this, that the grieving changes and those memories become, instead of acid, painful, awful, they actually can become comforting at times. And the sorrow is still there, but, but there's a comfort in the thoughts. And your family ain't there by a long shot. No. But you're still struggling with, what do you do to make sure the world doesn't forget her? For, I'm, that's why I'm, one of the reasons I'm thrilled that folks at Independence Institute every year do the um, Courage Classic for uh, Children's Hospital. They have a team for my daughter Parker, Team Parker. And it just makes me, it, it warms my heart when they ride their bicycles, because I couldn't do it. Uh, and <laughs> We're going to get you on a bike one of these years. You <laughs> will never get me on a bike, <laughs> unless it has a motor on it. Um, and it just it makes me feel warm. Um, you're doing something similar to, to keep Josie alive. Yeah, so the, the, this idea to run the Antarctica Marathon, yes, I always say, yes, that Antarctica, because people always question, like, there's, there's a, two Antarctica for some reason. Uh, one of Josie's nurses, when she was getting her treatments, um, ran this very unique Antarctica marathon. And my brother-in-law, kind of off the cuff, mentioned, mentioned it to me. He said, when, when we get through this, when we beat this, I want to run that marathon. And, and he had that, and, and I always remember that. And uh, uh, 
when Josie did pass about 13 months later, uh, I pulled him aside at Christmas Eve and said, you know what we need to do? We need to do this. We need to do All this. Right. You're raising some money f for this, yes. for the right cause. Yes. And if people want to help out, go to freedomfy.com. That's freedomfy.com. And you'll, you can pledge some money right th then and there on freedomfy.com. You put together a little video for raising money for this, uh, to fight the disease that got her, the cancer that got her. I, I want to I I play this because I, I, I'm just so grateful you've done it. Let's, yeah, let's roll this. The phone rang, and my mom said, it's the worst news possible. It's a rare form of incurable brain cancer, and they are giving Josie nine to 16 months to live. And I pulled up this picture on my phone of this seemingly healthy, smiling, beautiful little girl, my niece, thought to myself, this little girl has one year to live, and it broke me. But running has always been my fallback, and I think it's become even more meaningful to me now, now that we're going to raise money for The Cure Starts Now. Team Josie is going to Antarctica to run this really unique marathon so that no other family has to go through what we went through or what Josie went through. 100% of all donations go to fund research for DIPG, the very rare type of cancer that Josie had. It is about living life for Josie, raising money in her honor, and never ever forgetting her. You know, the never forgetting her part is, I, I still go to bed and wake up every, every day thinking, people don't know this girl, my girl, Parker. And I feel this need to, to, I don't want to say live her life, but to achieve things because she existed. And a race like this, you know, um, it raises money because people think this crap can't happen to them. And here we are sitting here. It's happened to you. Where does the money go? It goes to the cure starts now. Uh, my sister, you know, in, in her pain and her grief, um, volunteering with this organization called The Cure Starts Now, which specifically funds research for DIPG. And you know, they say they're looking for the, the home run cure because this type of cancer is it's such a, uh, an aggressive and, and, and hard cancer to cure. Once we cure that, we'll cure all cancers. So it's a very neat organization that focuses on DIPG cancer research. And things like this that I used to kind of blow off, not only does it help the grieving, it helps remember, but it also helps people uh, who might do it in the future. So again, it's FreedomFi, FreedomFY.com. Look for this smiling mug. Todd, give your best to, to your family. I'm, uh, I'm glad you're doing it. I will, I will, thank you. I should note, I'm, I'm trying to win the marathon as well, so you got that, that <laughs> on that plate too. Terrific. <laughs> Check thank it out, you, and we'll see you next week.